all know the pace of life can be pretty hectic. And as the way we live continues to speed up, the way we eat is changing too. Every day, we're eating millions and millions of pre-packed portions of instant energy. In fact, you could say, we've gone completely snacking mad. Our insatiable enthusiasm for snacks translates into some telling statistics. In the last 10 years, sales of savoury snacks have risen by almost 300%. A recent survey revealed that almost half the meals we eat are taken in snack form. And amongst school-age children, snacks, chocolate and fast food can make up over 80% of all the calories they get. Tell us what you've had to eat since you've been here today. Um, pack the crisp, cheeseburger, chips, coke, sweets. Doritos. Body chips, know. cheeseburgers, uh -huh. McDonald's, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Stuff we usually like to eat. Yeah. <laughs> I went to Pizza Hut and I've had loads of pizzas. Uh -huh. Chips and burger and sweets. We've become a grazing society. We're snacking on the hoof. Um, life is so pressured. We're trying to cram so many activities into our daily lives. And snacks um, form a natural part of that kind of lifestyle. They give us a freedom of choice to eat where we want and when we want. I think we should be terribly concerned about snacking. It, it used to be something that people did between meals to keep you going. But now snacking has become a substitute for proper eating. So there's not really any point in the day when many people sit down and enjoy a, a properly prepared meal. And there are now many children uh, and teenagers who really do genuinely believe that a bag of crisps, uh, a fizzy drink, and a piece of chocolate confectionery is a balanced and quite common and acceptable way of eating. And that is, that is really um, very frightening. So should we relish the freedom to eat what we want, where we want, when we want? and celebrate the liberation from the ball and chain of the family dinner table? Or is fast food something to fear? A conspiracy on the part of the food industry, an erosion of family values, and a nutritional catastrophe? Us humans are designed to be grazers rather than gorgers. That is, for almost all of our evolution, we've lived by plucking things from trees or pulling them out of the ground and eating when we're hungry. And in fact, the scientific evidence supports the idea that eating little and often is better for us. The problem isn't snacking as such, it's what we're snacking on. We are a nation of monster munchers, crunching our way through 1.6 billion pounds worth of crisps and other snacks. These snacks do not grow on trees, they're not part of our evolution, and they're not doing us any good. But for every nutritionist flashing urgent warning signals at the grazing culture, there's another giving the growing traffic of snackers the green light. Take, take a, a bag of ready salted potato crisps, the most popular of the savoury snacks. The potato is complex carbohydrate, which we're told is very healthy for us. It's a rich source of vitamin C. A bag of potato crisps contains more vitamin C than an apple, for example. This is complete rubbish. A bag of crisps may give you a tenth of your vitamin C requirement. Most snacks, by the way, have no vitamin C whatsoever. Now, a really bad apple can also provide a paltry eight milligrams. That's a tenth of your vitamin C requirement. But most good apples, that is traditional varieties of apples, will provide 60 milligrams, almost 10 times that amount. They're also a good source of vitamin E which is an essential antioxidant. So what you've got basically is healthy fat with additional nutrients. So that, that's the ideal uh, uh, source of energy in the diet. Even the ones that are better and don't have added chemicals are still what we call empty calories. That is, they fill you up, but they provide no real nourishment at all. So let's leave the great nutritional debate in its customary gridlock and consider the social implications of the snack culture. I'm worried not just about where we are now, but where we're potentially going. It seems to me we can go down the American route, which is ever faster food, snacking, junk food, and really diminishing pleasure in what we eat. 
Or we can really look at the European model, which is to say there's times in the day when everyone sits down and enjoys food, and food is a pleasure, and we actually regard it as an activity we want to spend some time on. I think the suggestion that snack foods are responsible for the breakdown of the family meal is a nonsense. I imagine snacks manufacturers would be astonished, if not flattered, to feel that they had so much power. Really, uh, snack foods are res a response to changing lifestyles. Um, the growth of the leisure industry is really what has dragged people away from the rigid routine of three square meals a day. Of course, it is always possible to come together as a family and snack. That in itself is fun. Snacking sessions en famille may not be everyone's idea of a good time, but would we really consume such staggering quantities of a food that we didn't actively enjoy or even have something of a passion for? There may be reasons quite apart from convenience why we are nutty about snacks. One of the interesting aspects which has emerged in the recent study of tastes has been the development of a concept called the bliss point. And the bliss point is the point at which the intensity of sensory experience produces the maximum amount of pleasure. So if I give you an example of a cup of tea, having poured your cup of tea, you put in some sugar if you like sugar, and then you add exactly the amount for which is pleasurable for you. If you put too much, you've exceeded the bliss point. If you put too little, you have gone under. And if you get just the right amount of sugar, you've hit the best point. It's very interesting when people go into a supermarket, they see a range of snacks in front of them, and they buy snacks which they believe will fit their own bliss point. And then they sit down in the chair and they sample them, and there is a positive feedback phenomenon which occurs, whereby when people have one, they find it very difficult to refrain from having another. This process has nothing to do with nutrition and satisfying hunger, but it's a matter of hitting the bliss point, getting the maximum peak of enjoyment out of the snack. So the joy of snacks is more to do with sensation than sustenance. But this raises a whole new issue in the snacking controversy. Is it acceptable to achieve one's oral pleasure in public? After all, not everybody likes to watch. The problem I have with the snack culture is that I have to suffer the consequences of other people eating wherever they want to, and I don't get a choice. So that in a train, the smell, the litter, and all the rest of it is something that I have to put up with. You can ask someone to turn down the Walkman. You can ask them to put out their cigarette. They have to put out their cigarette. But there's no way that you can ask them to stop eating. So what do you do? You can't take the Big Mac and chuck it out the window. You can't screw up their spicy knickknacks. It's something that you just can't communicate to them because they feel it's their right. There's really no point in going to war against the snacking culture because it's a war you can't win. Snacking is with us already and it's here to stay. What it does is puts increasing pressure on the manufacturers to be ever more ingenious and creative. So for the future, I think we can look forward to greater choice, more exciting tastes and textures. I think we're going to find that we're all much happier snackers. <laughs>